Hi, and welcome back to all the delegates. Yes, we promised you that this time we'll bring you into the path of arts and how you can discover resilience and adaptability through arts. And guiding you through this journey of being inevitable is none other than Esther Gare, a Penang-born watercolor artist who is actually a trained anesthesiologist, but later on took up full-time. So over to you, Esther. Thank you, Carol. Yes, the idea is to have fun with this project, not stress yourself. I understand that drawing and painting um, to some people, just those words are a great source of stress. But um, the idea is we've got an easy to do project, so um, just have fun with it, okay? I am predominantly a botanical artist, so this is a little bit different from what I would normally do. It's a really nice little project that you can do easily. Um, I will be doing an ink and watercolour um, demonstration today, but if you don't have watercolours handy, just use whatever you have, colour pencils, watercolour pencils, anything, anything you have on hand. So um, you will have received your template, um, and um, it's easy to draw. I've chosen motifs and elements that are really easy um, and simple to draw. Uh, it's in the shape of a wreath, and to go with our theme of being inevitable, I've chosen um, Peranakan-inspired motifs because the Peranakans were um, adept at adapting, and um, I've used some of their common motifs um, and adapted them to a more uh, classical, um, festive uh, project, that, which is the wreath. Uh, you can use wreaths for any festive occasion, and I like the fact that you've got that nice white space in the center, so you can actually um, write a greeting in it, and it makes a lovely little gift, or you can write some inspirational quote in the center for yourself or for anyone else you think requires it. Uh, again, wreaths are great because you can size, downscale, whatever you like, okay? Um, so I have inked uh, my elements already. Let's talk about pens. There are many different pens. I'm just using a straightforward black pen. The uh, only thing I would caution is if you are going to paint over it, then you need to get a permanent pen. Uh, any pen that does not have permanent ink will bleed when you introduce water and paint to it and will be, be a bit messy. And that's not necessarily what you want. Uh, in terms of size, some people may be wondering how thick or how thin. I tend to go for uh, 0 0.1. These are a couple that I like to use. Uh, 0 0.1 or 0 0.2. Um, I've used a 0 0.1 here. It's a nice thin, crisp line, but not so thin that it gets lost. So um, notice there are, because of the, these, are, these elements are inspired by uh, Peranakan wall tiles, they are square, and um, you may ask, would I use a ruler to draw the square? And I would say yes. When I first draw it in pencil, I will use a ruler just to get the squares right, but when I ink it, then I tend to prefer to do it freehand. Um, just because it's, it's a loose style, it, it's a bit more organic, um, you don't have that real tightness. But having said that, because you're supposed to be having fun with this, if that's what you prefer, then go ahead. Okay, so um, I've inked mine, as I said, and uh, let's start painting. Oh, let's talk about paints. So I'm using a, um, a mixed color palette. I think this is 24 colors. Um, this is by Schmincke, but you can get different brands, um, different sets. I'm using a smallish brush. This is a size two round for those who want to know the details, just because there are small elements and I want to be able to do that without um, being too messy with it. Uh, I use two pots of water. One clean, one to rinse my brush in. 
uh, and that is just helpful and it's a habit I've, I've learned. And I will, as we're going along, um, tell you a few of the tips and tricks that I've learned along the way just to make painting a, a little bit easier um, for you. Uh, a napkin, old towel that you've cut up, a little old napkin or even you know just a paper napkin, whatever you have at hand is fine. This is, this is for um, drying your brush off because sometimes you get too much water and it gets everywhere. Okay, the other thing I also do is because I tend to be a little bit clumsy and I find my brush drops so I drip paint or whatever, I have a scrap piece of paper that I put under my hand. I'm right-handed. So the other thing that I've picked up is if you're right-handed, put all your painting materials on the right and your coffee or your drink on the left. The last thing you want to do is dip your brush into your coffee and then into your paint. So that's another little tip for you. Um, okay, so this prevents me from inadvertently just smudging, um, picking up paint and smudging it everywhere. Okay, I guess let's get started. So with a project like this, uh, again, if you're using color pencils, go ahead. If you're using paint, then I'll, I'll tell you how I paint. Um, because um, these elements are inspired by uh, Puranakan motifs, I want to, for this project, use colors that are reminiscent of the Puranakan um, style. So pinks, uh, greens, yellows, that, that sort of thing. Having said that, you can use whatever you want and you can be as bright and colorful or as muted as you like. I'm gonna go quite bright um, and I'll show you how to build up the color as we go along. So let's start with a peony first because I think that's quite um, simple to work on. What I d will do is I will work on each element or each section of the element separately rather than doing it all in one whole. It just gives me a little bit more control, um, and I'll show you how to develop some depth in color as well. So what I do is um, load my brush with a clean water, choose, choose one segment. I am gonna go for the center one. So I'm just going to, as you can see, paint that segment with water. Another tip here is don't paint right up to the ink line, or if it's not inked, the pencil line. Just stop short of it, right? And um, you can see that, hopefully, that there's a fair bit of water there. So I'm gonna go in with a pink now. And I'm gonna just drop in um, pink here, right in the center. Just there, you can see where there's still the water is just picking up the paint and pushing it a little bit forward. And you can use your brush to um, spread the paint a little bit. Rinse my brush off, dry it. Now, what I'm trying to do here is concentrate the color a little bit towards the center of the flower rather than take it all the way up to the edge. I want a little bit of color towards the edge, but not a lot, okay? So you can see that I'm gonna add another layer as I'm talking, get my paper underneath me, just in here. All right, so you can see that what I'm trying to achieve is just build strength of color near the bottom section and just let the water pull the rest of the paint forward, okay? Now, moving on, so when you're painting watercolor, what happens is that if you paint right next to where you've just painted, it will tend to bleed into each other. So what I do is I find a segment that is away from where I have just painted, and same process. just water within the inked lines. 
And you can see there's quite a lot of water there. Just drop, literally, it, it, it is what, I've, what it means. Drop the paint in where you want the strongest color. If you want to direct the paint a little bit more, you can. If you want to just leave it, that's also fine. In fact, I think I actually like that more than this. So um, that's what I'm going to do. Um, and really, it's repeating the process as you go along, as you go around. Now, if you're working with color pencils, what you would do is um, concentrate your color in the center of the flower and go for darker color and just lighten it as you go out towards the edge and you'll get a very similar um, effect. Okay. Yeah, I quite like that. So I'm not gonna overdo the um, spreading of the, of the paint in this instance. I, I really like how um, that effect is. Having said that, if you want to just go ahead and paint each section entirely flat, like so, of course you can. Um, adding water just helps spread the paint along a little bit. So this is what I would call a flat wash of color. And you can do that, absolutely no reason why you can't. It's a personal preference, okay? So you would go around and just do each section at a time. Now, this is quite a large piece, so um, there's absolutely no way that I'm gonna be able to finish painting all this in the time that we have. So what I wanna do is work through parts of each um, of the motifs so that you have an idea of what um, you can do. So I'm gonna work on the leaves next. I think I'm gonna go for a, quite a bright pale green. Um, and that one too. So as you can see, I don't always start with water on the paper and then paint going in, I do a little bit of both. It depends on how much paint I have on my brush and how much paint I, um, how much, w how large, shall I say, how large a section I'm trying to paint. If I'm trying to paint a very large section, then I do like to have a bit of water um, on the paper first. Okay, it went in a bit strong, so I just added just some water just to pull back on the color a bit. So there is no real attempt at realism here. Um, if that is what you like, then do try and do that. But in this case, I'm not, um, that's not the intention. So while this is a bit wet, I'm just using a little bit of the darker green. I'm not sure we can see that. And just bringing some of the darker green into, not the entire leaf, but just like the either half or cent the center portion of it, just to give it a little bit of definition. Um, so it's still quite, quite loose and um, free and easy, I would say. Okay, now I'm going to See how rich this green is. I'm gonna do the too dark. The other ones in a darker green. Um, the other thing about watercolor that you need to um, be aware of is that when it dries, when, when you paint when you paint with it, it goes in quite strong. Um, the color strength can be quite strong. But it does dry uh, paler 
So that's just something to be aware of. So if you think, oh, I've gone in a bit too strong, um, don't worry. Either add a bit of water to it or um, see how it dries because it will dry a little bit paler. Now, if you want a lot of very strong color and you've painted it and you think, oh, it looks a bit pale, it will be too pale, right? Just so, just so you're aware of, of that. Okay. Um, what I also want to do is I, I'll just move to the next element so that you can actually see how I progress. What I do want to do is um, continue the colors along um, the entire painting uh, just to have a little bit of continuity and to just tie the whole painting together, as it were. Um, there's something to be said for rainbow colors, but um, I like to have a bit of obvious continuity from element to element, so that the, the whole painting just looks like it belongs together, you know? Um, okay, so I'm gonna do that, red. So I'm introducing red along the way, or, or that pinky red along the way, just so that it's, it's somewhere um, wherever we go. So let's, let's do this one here. Again, because it's not meant to be um, super realistic and overly tight, I'm also not being uh, overly obsessed with filling in the spaces between the inked margins. Okay, I'm gonna have to bring this up. And in any case, when you look at the enameling on um, Paranacan tiles or um, their enamelware, you'll see that because um, the potter has painted, hand painted all these elements as well, uh, they're not perfectly um, up to ev all the edges. So I'm gonna start introducing a bit of yellow now, just to, as we said, bring in the idea of um, the colors that are typical of Peranakan um, iconic images. So decisions, decisions, where to put everything. So there's no yellow in the peonies, but the green is quite a yellow green, so I think that that works. You can add a bit of yellow if you wanted to, just to, um, you know, tie the images together. It's entirely up to you. Okay, I am going to also now um, put in some blues. We've got a lot of greens now, let's go and put in some blues. Um, Let's see, this is quite a nice bright blue. So what I wanna do is with the tiles, you can fill in the background of the tiles or not. Again, it's entirely up to you. I'm gonna show you how to fill in this background. So this is where having water helps because what happens with watercolor is if you um, put paint down, like so, if you apply the paint onto the paper, you end up with this hard line, which can be difficult to get rid of. Um, so having water on your paper helps to spread it out. So what you are trying to do is pull the paint along. So I've diffused this edge with water and I'm now pulling the paint along and I'm adding a bit of green to my blue, really making it quite soft and um, allowing the colors to, to blend. I'm trying to stay still quite pale. Oops. Okay. 
it's never the end of the world if you are painting too strong because all you need to do is add a bit of water and that will pale your color down quite easily. So all I'm doing is bringing the water around to where I started. Okay, this is where I'm going to turn the page so that I don't inadvertently pick up some wet paint. Okay, a bit of strength in color now. And because the paper is quite wet, I can manipulate the paint really easily. Okay, so I like that effect. Um, you may or may not, you may want it just a flat color, but I like that parts of it are quite pale and parts of it have gone from blue to green and it just gives a little bit more of a um, blended feel. So uh, there's a lot of wet paint in there now, so I'm going to move on to something else, a different area. Otherwise, it will all just blend into each other. So I'm going to tackle this one here. And let's go green, shall we? So there's quite a lot of um, dipping in and out of my water pots, as you can see. And um, that is essential to painting with watercolor because that's, that's what it is, is water and color, right? So you're constantly moving from your water pot to your paint and um, moving your paint along the paper. That's how I would best describe it. And if the paper gets a bit too dry, then just add a bit of water to it. All I'm trying to do is to avoid having harsh lines. I'm just trying to keep the paint wet enough to keep going. So as you can see, my colors are quite bright, but they're not super, super strong. If you like really strong, powerful, punchy color, go for it. Okay. So I know I say so a lot. Um, as I am painting along, you'll see that I'm moving from section to section just to allow everything to dry because if I'm introducing um, paint into a wet area, it will smudge, it will um, not be as clean and crisp as I like. I think this area has had a chance to dry, so I am going to put in, what shall I do here? I could go in with a bit more pink. Um, you can plan your color uh, composition, your color decisions before you start. Uh, or you can wing it like I am right now. It's entirely up to you. And um, I don't think there's any real issue doing it either way because everyone's brains work differently. And some people prefer to plan, some people prefer to just see what happens. I'm just introducing a bit of a deeper pink right at the edge, just to give it a little bit of shape. Oops. Okay. Right, let that rest for now. Let's come back to this peony. Okay, I want to do these little ribbony things blue, 
this is where the um, thin brush comes in because they're quite small. So um, I don't want to be struggling with a large, overly large brush and trying to get paint into tiny areas. I'm going to use just a little bit of dark blue. Um, and again, just to give a little bit of shape to the area, just right on the edge. So this is another, um, not a trick, but a, but a technique which um, some people don't realize. When you're painting tiny areas, what helps is to have your hand, uh, the heel of your, your hand firmly on the paper, get the brush up, um, almost upright. So this is almost calligraphic. Uh, in style, so that you are, you have full control of the point of your brush, and you have full control of where the paint is going to go. Quite often, what happens is that uh, people struggle with doing details and and um, creating a very crisp edge. And it's entirely due to the fact that their brush is not right up to where you can control the point. And if you are uh, painting like this, the end of the brush will splay and um, it will not give you a nice crisp edge. So um, that's one thing that is a big take home message for those of you who do struggle with painting in watercolor. Okay, let's. Put some blue in here, I think. Okay, I want to go quite strong in here. Because why not? And I'm happy to take questions. Um, if anyone has them. Right. I'm concentrating a bit because I'm coming into like little areas where I need to concentrate a bit. So can't talk and paint at the same time when I'm doing that. Okay, bring that round. Bit too much paint. Again, if you have too much paint on your brush, just rinse it out a little bit in the water or have a palette that you can um, just put the excess paint on. Just trying to balance these now so that I've got a balanced strength of color. That's quite nice. I like that. Um, questions How do you identify your art style? More plan or more winging it, sort of? Definitely, um, when I am painting um, botanicals, it is completely planned. In fact, I will uh, do multiple sketches. I'll take a gazillion photographs, and I'll do sketches and studies. And everything is planned. I will do color studies. I will do um, full drawings. Everything is planned. This sort of project, I can wing it because it's, it's more relaxed and, and really it depends on what you want to do. If you um, just want to do a little drawing and painting for fun, you can wing it. Um, if you want to do something that's a bit more um, controlled, a bit more, um, how shall I say? Uh, precise, then you do have to plan. I think there is a bit of a 
misconception about watercolor that uh, it is very loose and it can be very loose but no matter how loose a painting style is there is still quite a lot of planning that has gone into the whole process so the painting may look quite loose but um, for example this piece uh, several hours of planning and thought did go into the the drawing and the um, composition phase of it all what do you do if you don't finish a piece and when you come back to it your creativity view just changes this is where planning comes into play uh, if you've planned a project and you know what it's supposed to look like I think um, for me anyway it tends to um, follow through no matter how often I go back and forth so sometimes I don't have a lot of time to spend on a piece and I can may maybe do an hour half an hour an hour uh, but because it's planned right from the beginning I know what colors I'm using I know exactly what I've done and I, it's all drawn up it's just the process of painting however if it's um, something that's looser that you're not uh, drawn out completely or you've planned completely then you can still amend for example if I had just drawn this out in pencil and I was just inking maybe a day later I can still change elements to it you know sometimes you come back to it and you look at it and you think oh this doesn't work you can still change it so once it's inked that's it so the only thing you can change is maybe the the way your color thought process is um, so there is a limit to how much you can adjust um, based on how you feel on the day I hope that answers your question where do I get my inspiration from um, I get a lot of inspiration from just walking around and looking at things and I am that strange person if you see the strange person in a garden peering at the flowers and taking photos that that will most likely be me um, I take loads and loads of photographs um, thousands of photographs and I don't use every single one of them necessarily but they're in my hard drive and I will pull them out um, and work on mm, collating different elements from different photos into a piece um, as I said before I'm predominantly a botanical artist so that's where my inspiration comes from plants flowers leaves fruit vegetables um, things like that having said that uh, I have been going around taking pictures of Peranakan tiles and taking pictures of Peranakan uh, tableware um, yes I will go and sit in a Peranakan restaurant and be taking pictures of their tableware and their hangings and the tiles on the floor so anywhere and everywhere is I, I guess the answer to that question what medium do you prefer or often use to do the coloring I like watercolor mm, that's my comfort zone medium I also like um, doing a fair bit of pencil work I sometimes feel when I've been doing a lot of painting in color I will often go back and do fully rendered drawings just in um, pencil just to get my brain retrained into thinking in black and white and tones um, but I have also painted a fair bit in um, acrylic mainly because of the requirements of uh, the piece that I have been either commissioned to do or you know where it's supposed to be hanging if a piece is going to be hanging outdoors it, it can't be in watercolor because the colors will fade in time and you can get um, in our climate you can get mold and all sorts of nasty things no matter how good the quality of paper or the paint that you use or how well framed it is there is always a risk um, so if I have a piece that um, I know is going to be exposed to the elements then I will 
paint in acrylic rather than watercolor, just because it will, um, it, it's a bit hardier. Okay, so I'm just filling in bits as we go along. And as we are chatting, Again, whether you choose to do this, you know, more concentrated color in the center thing that I'm doing, or whether you choose to just do a flat um, wash of color is entirely up to you. And if you have a good range of colors like, like this one, uh, you know, anything from 12 to 24 colors, it's, that's plenty for you to um, be choosing from without having to mix colors or um, be too um, limited with your color range. I want feel like I want to really put some color punch in there and there. So that's what I'm going to do. Just the same color but stronger and just more concentrated right in that area. Um, this is what I call um, blurring the edge. Well, it is dis also described as um, softening the edge in books. Uh, and all it is, is when you apply color straight on, like so, it will dry with a sharp edge. So what, if you want the edge to look more blended and um, kind of diffuse, what you do is, this is another reason why I have the two pots. In the clean water, uh, dry it off a little bit so that your brush is damp, um, but not soaking wet, and just kind of agitate the edge, the painted edge. So what you're doing is you're introducing water into that edge, and it will soften it and kind of um, just bring the, the color through without uh, being overly strong, okay? So if you've got small areas and you don't want to have too much water in there, that's what I would recommend that you do. Put the paint in, just dry your brush off a little bit and just soften that edge. I really like this bright pink. It's called magenta on my palette, and it's a beautiful, bright, bright pink. Sometimes on its own, it's, I feel it's maybe a bit too bright, so I add a little bit of the red that's next to it, um, and that just tones down the pinkness a little bit and makes it a little bit redder, which is, which is quite nice as well. I have been accused of fiddling, and I do fiddle, and sometimes you just have to just stop, don't fiddle, move on. Let's see whether we can get this one finished. What do you do when you get stuck when you're creating your art? Perhaps some tips that might work for us when, oh, when you're in a rut. We all get in a rut every now and then. Um, what do you do? What I do do is draw. Um, just draw anything. Just get your pencil going. I don't even attempt to paint when I am in a rut. I just draw. It can be anything. The chair, the table, um, your box of paints, for example. Um, really just to get the the brain and the, the hands going again. So um, it, it, when I talk about going back to just doing, doing uh, pencil drawings, that is often something I do in between paintings because it's a, nice, it's a nice way of keeping going, but you don't really have any idea what you want to do. Um, so that's what I do. 
What medium do you use on canvas? Um, acrylic on canvas. You can get watercolor uh, um, medium, which you can uh, uh, watercolor ground. Sorry, pardon me. Which you can paint onto canvas, which will then make the canvas accept watercolor. I don't like it. I will use acrylic on canvas. If you're an oil person, use oil. Um, what's the biggest piece I've done? What was it for? How long, well, how long did it take to complete it? The biggest piece I've done, I believe, was a four foot by, f four foot by five. I, I did two four feet by five feet paintings for uh, the art and garden. It took me about two plus months. Um, maybe about three months to do both pieces, um, just painting, from conception to completion, maybe about four months or so. Um, if you've been to uh, the Penang Hill Lower Station, I also painted um, some of the columns there, and those took about a week each. Um, and they were in acrylic as well because they were they were open to the elements and uh, um, uh, uh, people would you know would touch them that sort of thing. So it was acrylic and then I think varnished over. <laughs> if you could paint the complexity of your creative mind, what and how would it look like? Oh my gosh, I really haven't. It's not something I've thought about, um, the complexity of my creative mind. I, I, I feel actually in terms of creativity, my brain isn't very creative. Um, I have a very orderly brain, and I think that is also why I went into science and medicine to start off with, because that's how my brain works. I need structure and I need order. Um, I'm not one who can um, just paint loosely or paint in an abstract manner. I like this because it's precise, it's tight. I know exactly what I'm doing. So I would say my creative mind is very compartmentalized. <laughs> it's not very interesting, but yes, that is, that is what my, my brain would look like. Um, I have been accused of being uh, Obsessive compulsive, in fact. So, um, and, and that that is that is true. I am obsessive about detail. I um, I don't do loose and too abstract well. Um, I also am unable to just pull things out of my brain and just draw them. I tend to work better with photographic references or um, live. Uh, references, for for example, um, I'm not one of those who has an um, unfathomable range or number of uh, images in my brain that I can just pull out and put on paper. Um, so this is this is one that I did earlier. We always have that, isn't it? This here's one that I did earlier. Um, so this I was was more planned um, than this one that I'm doing now. Although the colors are similar, I've kept to the same color palette, you know, with the yellows, the pinks, the blues, the greens. Um, but this one I spent a bit more time thinking it through and uh, working out where everything was going. Uh, not too dissimilar, but you can see here with the two peonies, this one I've gone much stronger today. And, and that's one of the things that you can actually do in terms of um, the question about, you know, what if you're on the day you feel like doing something different? So I felt stronger colors today, puncher colors today. So I went stronger. Here it's a bit uh, paler. It's still quite pretty. But today I feel like, oh, if, I, if I'm looking at it now, I actually want to go in and, and get more color there. Um, so that's where, you know, you can tweak um, your paintings, tweak your creativity in that sense. Um, yeah, so just work your way around the wreath. And again, uh, as I said, 
reefs are great. They're, they're, they're so easy to adapt to different um, um, festive occasions, different projects, uh, different um, things. It can be a gift, it can be for yourself, you can use different elements, choose whatever you like and choose whatever elements really um, strike you uh, and um, you, you like the look of. There's so many, many, many coloring books, there's so many images online that you can you know, draw inspiration from um, and uh, incorporate into your, your uh, painting. Um, so that one is there. I'm just gonna try and finish this peony if we have time. And um, I think the most important thing is to f not feel that every painting has to be perfect and that every time you put pencil to paper or paint to paper or whatever it is, it has to be um, a fully completed project or it has to be um, the best thing that you've ever done. You know, I, I think when you put too much pressure on yourself um, that way, uh, you are more inclined to um, get stuck in the rut or, you know, run out of ideas or um, just not be happy with what, what you've done. I think you need to give yourself the freedom to create, not overstress about it, and just, just go with the flow of it, you know. Unless, of course, you are doing a commission and you have to do it, you know, it, it has to be completed, then that's a different scenario. But, but what I'm talking about here is doing this for fun, doing this for balance, get your creative juices going, balance out the stresses in your life, just do something that doesn't require too much thought, okay? Well, I hope you guys have enjoyed um, spending this hour or, or so with me. I know I gabble a lot, um, but um, it's, it's fun to, to do a little bit of drawing, a little bit of painting, do try it on your own. Um, again, as I said, there are so many images available uh, online and in coloring books. Use them. Buy a coloring book and color it whatever you want, okay? So my take-home message is don't get burdened, overburdened by the stresses that the days, today, life today is all about. Do give yourself time. Give yourself some playtime, playtime, creative time, you know, just do something completely different. Okay, thank you so much for joining me and um, have a good weekend, everyone. All right, thank you, Esther Gare. Thank you for walking us through how to be resilient and adaptable through art. That was really relaxing. I think what a good way to end with the last session for Be Inevitable 2020, the fifth edition of Be at Penang. We, should, we are streaming live right now from Penang, Malaysia. So I have an, some message from our organizers, PSAP and Andres 40 events. You will now we will now be activated and be stimulated to hyperdrive your recovery. You have heard from Professor Eddie Obeng to face reality and act quick and now creatively. The new world will not wait for those who hesitate or refuse to move with the demands of the new economy. We've heard time and time again the importance of digitalization and how we can adopt technology by collaborating with partners. Do not reinvent. Just collaborate with tech providers. In order for us to be equipped with this new normal, we must reskill our stuff ourselves. PSAP is invested in ensuring the industry grows and grow and help you grow as talents and professionals of business events Penang. The lessons of these two days will not end but will continue. 
So don't forget to fill in the evaluation form and get your attendance certificated. certificated. And yeah, to all the speakers and delegates and the crew who made it all possible for this virtual edition of Be At Penang, the fifth edition, we'd like to say a big thank you. And please give yourself a round of applause and a tap on your back. This has been fantastic. Two days, very fruitful. I hope we've learned from each other as we learn to grow and continue to fight on, be strong, be bold. So see you next year at B at Penang. Take care and bye-bye.